the problem we're facing is that you're working with two realities. You're working with what we assume is the real way to function and move. And then we're working with a system of what we call power, exchange of power, economic power, power over people, controlling their lives. And in order to do that, you disguise certain persons and send them into roles to influence, they take, they become actors on a stage and they influence our minds in a way that is not real, but affects a reality that will touch us later. First real six string, bought it at the five and dime. Played it till my fingers bled. It was the summer of '69. Me and some guys from school had a band and we tried real hard. Jimmy quit, Shorty got married. We should've known we'd never get far. Oh, I look back now. Before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. A day late with the coffee chat, but this is our coffee chat. How are you doing today, today, Catherine? I'm good, and it's my fault we're late because I've been somewhere with no internet all week, really, all really intermittent. So, yeah, a Friday coffee chat for once. It's totally fine. I think it's actually serendipitous because... We were chit-chatting about um, the video I dropped yesterday, which thank you to our Doug, our friend, our late friend, Doug, who had started unraveling some of these um, these conspiracies. And we were talking off camera, Catherine, about one thing that Doug, I really respected about Doug, which I think we could all kind of do this ourselves, is when he realized he had been fooled and he accepted it, he decided mm -hmm. to figure out how they did it. And there's so much information and in learning how they did it to him so that he was educated enough to see where where that could happen, where mind control could happen again. But he ended up kind of uncovering, he became kind of an accidental conspiracy theorist because he ended up in his own research over a decade's worth of research before he even hopped on YouTube, connected all these dots with some of these really famous cases like Charles Manson, Son of Sam, um, and I know that Doug and I were going to do a huge new series where we were going to look at his research and add mine to it. And since he's passed away, Catherine, you, myself, Tamara, Shanti, we've kind of agreed to like go forward and take clips from Doug's videos and continue to put his work out. And so I wanted to talk to you, Catherine, today and get your perspective on the subject that I spoke about yesterday. I know you've seen the video about Samuel Untermeyer and Untermeyer Park which kind of led to where they were doing rituals for Son of Sam, which will be part two, which Catherine is going to do with me as well. So what was your reaction to all that information, Catherine? You know, when you get literally get goosebumps, when you just something, you just feel click, 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 all the bits are coming together. And what I loved about it and what I loved about a lot of the other research that you and Doug have done is 
we all talk in the spiritual community about as above so below and everything's connected and everything is energetically connected in fact just earlier on this afternoon i was talking with shanti about the ether because they deliberately took the ether out of the periodic table so it used to be talked about in the old manuscripts and books a lot and now it's not and i think what you're uncovering with this work is so crucial because it's showing one how much these things are planned and coordinated across a lot of the areas of the globe actually and how these secret societies really use a lot of this for power control manipulation and basically human experimentation um and i think you know the gardens of babylon the the fact it's so easy to be told that they imported a lot of this stuff in but did they and question it and look at the significance and what and why they're doing so i think this is a huge part of the jigsaw puzzle that really starts pulling together how much it's like anything as we always say bryce two things can be true at once and and when you're looking at cults there's so many different scales along the thing and i think what is very easy to do is when you isolate things and make it look like a one-off isolated thing and you get all the hype surrounding it again it's a big distraction to stop people connecting the dots and see where it's happening in other areas of life and unfortunately we all know that as Doug spoke about all the time, that it's a very slippery slope once you get into this. You suddenly, it's like a bit like when your body develops allergies. You get to a stage where you can see it, see it, see it, and then you reach that tipping point where you can no longer see it and you're in there. Yeah, it's 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 wild. And that's the thing too, I love how you said that because when we look at like Son of Sam, which if you're not from the United States and don't know who Son of Sam, Son of Sam is, don't worry, Catherine and I are going to do that video next week with some of Doug, Doug's work as well. But Son of Sam basically was a serial killer and um, in the 70s. And we had Charles Manson with the family. We think these are isolated events. I always thought they were isolated events. I always think all these things are just some crazy wackadoo person that just goes off and do, does these things. But then when you have someone like Doug who sees these connecting dots and goes, hold on a second, hold on a second. This evidence is telling me these are not isolated events and this is all part of these three letter agency mind control programs. And there's a d bigger purpose as to what these killings actually were. And with, with Untermeyer, for those who have not seen the video, and I don't, Doug didn't specifically see, speak about Untermeyer Park and Samuel Untermeyer himself because Doug's interest was more in the Scientology aspect of it. And so that was part of my contribution, what I shared yesterday, because I'm petty and I'm nosy. And my thing, Catherine, we've learned, and I think as spiritual people ourselves, we kind of already know this, like people don't go and just do a ritual at a random location, do they? No. It's very, the, the, I, I just think that's such an important point you've raised because the more you look into it, you more you realise there's a, a significance of reason and energy behind all of it. So things that might seem, you know, we're so used to being told to put things down as coincidences, but in this world, there are no such thing as coincidences. You're attracting things. You're attracting things. You can attract things to the law of the attraction positively. But if you're unaware, you can also attract things or be used to attract things on the negative side of things. Yeah, it's there's there's power all around us, and the the dark ones, um, they the bad guys. They they I feel like our ancestors absolutely knew this yes. across the board, and things like the Hess Act kind of took that information from us and make that made that information kind of folklore or conspiracy or woo woo or pseudoscience, right? Whereas they they're using it as a reality. And so mm -hmm. for me, when I heard about this this cult, the satanic cult using Untermeyer Park, which is in Yonkers, New York. And at the point at the time that this park was being used in the 70s, it was totally derelict. Like it had totally fallen apart. There was, you know, people, uh, graffiti everywhere. And one of the researchers I looked and I said this in the video is that even though this was a derelict park, it wasn't that fancy in the 70s as it was when Untermeyer owned it, it wasn't hidden. Yeah. And so for this group of people in the 70s, people did complain about them seeing lights, torches, hearing chanting from the park. So they weren't trying to really hide themselves. 
And you would think that if you were doing these nefarious things, you would want to hide yourself more. So it's obvious that they picked this location for a specific reason. It's obvious that they needed whatever was in this location. And, and guys, I am going to be tug uh, tagging that video down in the description box below so you have more of a thorough understanding of what we're talking about here. Um, if you want to pause this and go and back and watch that first. But Sam Untermeyer, he was, he was a very famous attorney here in the United States at the turn of the century, um, going from the 19th century to the 20th century. His parents were German immigrants. He grew up in Virginia on a, allegedly a plantation, which is strange to me because I'm from the South. Plantation owners, they were the gentry, they were the, the high class, and they were, it was lineage. So for mm -hmm. someone to come in in the 1800s, right before the Civil War, and become a plantation owner is very suspicious to me. Like, how did that happen? So that's already like a, a red flag to me about his family. Um, his father did fight for the South in the Civil War. He passed away. The family moved to New York. Sam became an, an attorney, um, uh, graduated Columbia Law School at the age of 20, and he worked with Rudolf Guggenheimer, which is a huge name, the Guggenheimer name. Like, you see that name, you're like, hold on. Yeah. You just happen to open up a law firm with Guggenheimer? But they were cousins. They were cousins. And so you start to see these dots connecting. He ended up being having the most powerful law firm in the United States for like 45 years. He was the first lawyer to make over a million dollars in one case, which is big. And he set up a honey trap. What we call a honey trap. I don't know if you remember this, Catherine. And this is where, it, you know, you could see this story as being something that's totally an American story. I'm dropping pens like crazy today. Um, an American story. But we know now that nothing that happens in one country is just to, isolated to one country, is it? Especially in the Western world. Completely. It's really important. And I heard an interesting um, fact on another podcast today. And it's really weird. All these little bits dropping in together. That America currently has 70 percent of the world's lawyers oh that doesn't shock me and it isn't and i know it's because you know a lot of people are pushed into that because when you graduate it's the highest paid job you could go into most of them are chronically depressed by the way but you know how much of that is because you know you come out with the zest of youth looking forward to life and then go into these jobs and realize the scale of the corruption with a lot of the things but that is ridiculous when you think about the globe that is a ridiculous and that i think it's all significant to what we're talking today these things they're not accidents and no. why why is it this you know part of these societies that attracts or, or use certain recruitment grounds basically well, we know, um, and this is that this would be an episode for a different day, but we know that the Bar Association here in the United States is actually illegal. It's actually against yeah. the Constitution because the, the lawyers have to sign an oath to the Crown. But we want our independence from the Crown. And so that's mm. already illegal. There's already... You know, so so with this manipulation, which is what I see it, and and I know, I and mean, we have there really there are really good attorneys out there. So oh, if you absolutely. Are really, you know, I'm just we're just generally speaking about these very strange head scratchers that we've missed before. We've missed this, right? We've we've missed this. Yeah, um, Gutenberg, uh, Samuel Uttenmeyer, Gutenberg, and Marshall. The other, uh, it was Guten Gutenberg, Uttenmeyer, and Marshall Law Firm. They were what I would consider to be woke mm -hmm. then. They were part of this progressive movement, which to me, the progressive movement is anything but. When I think of like progression, I think of giving people more freedom, allowing people more, more, more uh, room to stretch their legs and to practice their. But the progressive movement still to this day is about control. It's yeah. about, he was really into big government. He wanted regulations on everything. And listen, there has to be a happy medium because there does need to be some regulations on like the stock market on, you know, it can't be the wild, wild west everywhere because people are going to be taken advantage of. So there does need to be some law and order. But we're seeing the impacts of big government today and how it's negatively as we're being tracked everywhere, you know, as we're being censored, all this kind of stuff. He was a proponent of this. He was also a Zionist. I'm not going to say much about that on YouTube. He was also a eugenicist. He really, truly believed in eugenics, these things, to weed out um, what he considered to be inferior, inferior races. And we know that that's, hello, like that's super big for 
the bad guys, right? They they are racist and they do believe in one one superior group. Um, but he got yeah, so what they've done is they've taken the concepts of the Wild West, which is in part of human nature, but all they've done is they've put it under the government umbrella. So it's less difficult for most people to actually put two and two together. Um so it, it they've not they've not solved it, they've just taken over and now they're there. They control of. the chaos. They control it. Yeah. He was, um, uh, Uttenberg was really behind the Federal Reserve. And that, again, is a, is a uh, episode for another day. But I think most of our friends watching are very familiar with the Federal Reserve, even though that is based, it was it was created off of the coast of Georgia on Jekyll Island. It's a it's not federal. It's a private bank. Um, and it, it actually kind of monitors the whole world. So even though it's based out of the United States, it is literally something that affects the whole world is where we get our tax system from, all that kind of stuff. And if you guys know anything about the Federal Reserve, Woodrow Wilson was in the White House when the Federal Reserve was was passed, and um, there was it was like on it was during the winter solstice. There was a very specific time he signed it into law, and um, we know there was a lot of controversy around the Federal Reserve Act. We know that there were a lot of very wealthy people um, who were opposed to the Federal Reserve that happened to be on the Titanic. That's a whole story on it in itself. And I kind of laughed when I discovered this story about Ut Utenmeyer. Not that it's funny. It's not funny at all. But it's like, son of a bitch. They've been doing this, this, the same stuff we see with Epstein, seeing that his list just came out. They've been doing this for a very long time. So basically, the story was, in a nutshell, that Woodrow Wilson started having a bit of an affair with this woman uh, while he was married, uh, before he became president. And this woman saved the love letters and she needed money to get her family out of a sticky situation. So she hired Utenmeyer as an attorney to basically blackmail Woodrow Wilson. So he went to Woodrow Wilson and said, hey, she's got these letters. She's going to expose them. This is in the 1910s, you guys. So, I mean, think about Bill Clinton. This would be a scandal today. Back yeah. then, over 100 years ago, it was even more of a scandal. And so Woodrow Wilson was in a panic because $40,000 back then was a lot of money and he didn't have it. And so Sam Utenmeyer, I mean, we've said this many times, Catherine the Cabal is many things, but stupid ain't one of them. He did have the money. And so he, he told Woodrow Wilson that he would pay the blackmail money for him if he did him some, some favors in government. That's honeypotting. Uh, it's... it's yeah. And so was he involved in the Federal Reserve then decision? Getting Woodrow Wilson forcing his pen. We knew that Woodrow Wilson's pen was forced to sign that. Yes. We know we've known that. And now we have an extra layer as to why he was owned. Utenmeyer basically owned the United States government. Mm -hmm. And how is that, my friends? Like, how does somebody become whose parents were an Im immigrant family from Germany? He was a first generation American. We, we often think this story is sold to us in America that immigrants are poor. They're coming over to, to seek the American dream. They're fleeing persecution. They're coming here with nothing. So how does this family fleeing persecution, immigrate to the United States, own a plantation right off the bat, become part of the gentry class? They're not, the parents are full on Germans. And then the son, the first generation American, becomes so powerful in his law office that he's now puppeting the president of the United States. Mm. That doesn't happen without something going on to make it happen. If that makes sense. Absolutely. I, I, there's a definitely a bigger picture there. And, you know, again, the synchronicities of him even finding out, you know, that this was happening with the blackmail. I mean, there's, it's so complex and you can see how it puts together and how then it snowballs and people get tied into these situations that they then feel they can't get out of. Well, it makes me wonder if that woman wasn't sent in anyway to to strike Woodrow Wilson's fancy to get him into a compromising position to then use it later on as ammunition, Absolutely. just like what Epstein did. So now we've got these politicians under our control. Um, Utenmeyer also, uh, for Maury Terry, who Maury Terry was a journalist who we'll get into him more with part two um, in the Son of Sam, but he did a huge research into the Son of Sam case, which led him down in all these different rabbit holes where he is the one that discovered 
Untenmeyer Park and discovered that Untenmeyer was actually a part of a dubious secret society in New York called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which is a big, a big secret society that literally is all over the world. I believe it started in London, but we have really big politicians throughout the world that have been a part of this secret society. And I've tried to do, I've researched the Golden Dawn a lot. It's really kind of boring, like the stuff you go through with the mechanics of, but they do channel, they do channel higher beings. Um, they're really into black magic. And Aleister Crowley was also a part of this Hermetic order. Mm -hmm. And Aleister Crowley obviously is English. Well, at this time, Aleister Cra Crowley was living in New York City. Mm -hmm. And so it looks like Untenmeyer and Aleister Crowley were contemporaries in this secret society. Now, I haven't found any research that actually puts them together or like they even knew each other. Yeah. They knew of each other, but that doesn't mean much, right? They could control, they could control that information. And so Untenmeyer ended up buying this estate in Yonkers, New York, and he bought it from an ex-governor. So it was a big estate and that, that was called Greystone. And this is what Catherine was talking about. And this is what really was weird to me. There's wealthy and then there's super wealthy. And they want us to believe that on this 150 acre estate, that Untenmeyer was able to have all these Roman pillars, these 2,000 year old Roman pillars imported from Italy to New York. And what now, year was this again? This was in the early, uh, he bought it in 1886. Right, okay. So we're not talking about with all the modern things. Well, we know that there was probably a lot more in that time than we've been made aware of, but still, it's not like you can't compare it with importing stuff and transporting stuff across the world to what how we do it now and i believe i mean we look at these important archaeological um relics in countries and they're protected they need to you know yeah. they want to protect it why are they going to throw these pillars on a ship and send them to new york mm -hmm. even if the guy's paying a shit ton of money and he's a wealthy lawyer but how wealthy is he like this is a, this would have to be millions and millions of dollars to do this and he imported so my thing and, and maybe like 10 years ago, I would have been like, okay, he just paid a lot of money for this. But we're starting to, to learn things, aren't we, Catherine, that like our geography isn't what, what we've been taught it is mm -hmm. either. So were these pillars already there? Were they, uh, what was this location? And if Utmeyer was already involved in this occultism, did he purchase, because he purchased it from another politician. So what is this land? Mm -hmm. that, and where was this stuff we know uh, are we we theorize there are people who theorize that the the world's fair which happened in chicago in the late uh, 19th century uh that that was really just a, a, a an excuse to build stuff and then destroy it so they could destroy other roman architecture that that was in chicago um we know that people have found egyptian money here in the united states so there's all there's isis temples everywhere so this there's all these kind of like red flags like showing us that maybe the american continent isn't what we've been taught it is he also had like these crazy statues like winged lions and these underground nooks where you would have a thousand steps where you could move in the steps and go into these secret temples with medusa heads to cast mm -hmm. spells and we know, you know, when Untermeyer was alive, this was a, a private property. But archaeologists have said when they've looked at the park, it, it, was, de it was donated to the, the city after he passed away, that these altars were there. Like, they weren't added later. Yeah. They, were, they were already there. So you're telling me Untermeyer built these altars? I don't think so. What do you think, Catherine? Do you think he built those altars or do you think they No, were I, I think we're seeing this so much and it's not an area I know a lot about, but every single time there's a consistent theme where the people who are involved in black magic and cults, they have very specific energy centers around the world. So it's like the, the good and the bad, if we want to put it simply, um, this information used to be available widely and people could read energy, dows for energy, these sacred, you know, whether they're portals, whatever these energy centers are. But the trouble is what's happened is the dark side have then sort of hidden that knowledge from the rest of us and kept it for themselves. And they certainly believe that they can then harness the energy for much greater effect, basically. So it's far too much of a coincidence in my world. I mean, there's, 
And we also know we're finding so much out about the archaeology in terms of what's been hidden. So the fact that that even came out in the first place, there's probably a lot more that they've not allowed them to actually share with us because we know a lot of the archaeologists that all over the world that are showing that, you know, the archaeology we've been taught bears no resemblance to what the real evidence is and it's been deliberately hidden. Right. We even have like uh, my the first video I did for Gnostic was over Gobekli Tempe, which is, you know, and that's over what in Turkey, like th this temple basically blows up any type of, of knowledge we thought we had in our human history because it basically smacks it across the face and says, you guys don't know anything about your own history. Yeah. you know. And after the guy who discovered that died, the UN came in and took over. So they are trying to stop, stop this information from coming out. But yeah, it's, it's too, it's, it's, um, you know, he also had in his gardens, it looked like the, the hanging gardens of Babylon, which is a conspiracy I've not covered on my channel. That's kind of a big one where they believed Babylon back at a certain point in history was luscious and green, you know? And so they, they talk about the hanging gardens of Babylon. Well, if we look at Tartarian maps, Babylon is, is the New York area. And so, so, which makes sense. That makes mm. sense to me. So did he model his gardens after this mythological luscious garden of Babylon? Or is it literally that? Is that literally Babylon? Is that literally, you know, these are the questions that I have. And I think these, these are, you know, it's so interesting, Catherine. We were talking about where we just said you, you get involved in a situation where you're in mind control and you see things, see, see things, see, see things, and then you don't see things anymore. Yeah. And something I've noticed too is like as we come into like this 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 area of awakening, I often think about this with religion, where people can see all these inconsistencies around the world, but still not be able to see the inconsistencies in their own belief system. And we know that if one thing is in question or two things in question, then we have to question everything. And just the geography is so bizarre to me that it's still almost shocking to me that what we've been taught where things aren't are might not be where they actually are if that makes sense oh you completely know? i mean there's so much to this there really is so much to it and i think one of the reasons it's, it's such a fascinating one for me because you can see why so many people are too scared to investigate these things because people don't want to bring dark energy into their awareness but again, how much of that is even true? How much is that to scare us off from looking where we need to be looking? Because these universal laws that are talked about in so many different ancient tra traditions, tribes, all different, what's really fascinating, and again, it's not an area I'm an expert in, but when you look at all these different teachings from all over the globe and all different parts in history, there's core principles that are repeated throughout them that and why are we not taught any of that anymore? And why is it so hidden? And why are words trans, you know, twisted, like even alchemy and the occult and 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 ridiculed? It's to stop people looking there. It's really, really interesting. And basically, it's a bit like the naughty child thing where you don't say, don't do that. Well, you know, they're really trying to stop people looking in certain information. Why? Because as we've said, they get the good can the man can manifest, the dark side can't. So they need to really control where our energy and attention is going. Oh, absolutely. And that's the thing that's important too, is like just because Untermeyer Park, as it's known today, has has obviously been used for very nefarious things. It's obviously a very powerful piece of land. Yeah. But the darkness can't create anything. It can only steal from the light and invert it. So even if it is Babylon, even if it is these things that we might have a negative connotation towards it it did not start off that way. It started off as something good. And, and if we can cleanse the land, if we can cleanse that area, it can be used for good again. Cause again, darkness can't create. It's only the light that can create and the darkness steals and inverts. That's why they do blood rituals is because they need that right. life force because they can't create it themselves. And, and that's such a, and I, I see that kind of vigilante attitude by some people They they wake up and they want to just destroy everything that's been used for negative but if you destroy everything then you're going to destroy everything because they've literally inverted it so is it our job to go back and like heal it but first we have to understand it and that's um and that's the, you're right Catherine like we we're just now relearning this stuff the this group of people has been teaching their kids this stuff for privately for years and so we're having to play catch up and that was the Hess Act that I spoke about many years ago I discovered the Hess Act which happened during World War II where 
you know, because the Nazis were majorly using um, divination and occultism to try, and occult just means hidden. It doesn't, occult's not a bad word. It just means hidden to try to win the war. And they were getting a lot of pushback because other people were also using the mm -hmm. same tools to counter their moves, specifically this guy named Hess, which is why it's called the Hess Act. So Hitler buddied up with the Pope. Not the first time they had buddied up, my friends, for the, our Catholic viewers. You probably guys probably know that the, hope, the Popes were very, very buddy-buddy with Hitler. Um, and they created this propaganda where they were going to start this propaganda campaign that divination, all these things, were of the devil. And that's still, an, you know, when people say that to me all the time, like, well, that's of the devil. I'm like, well, that's Nazi propaganda. That's the Absolutely. And so we've been afraid of this. As 99% as, as of the public, what Sam Untermeyer was able to do to monopolize power was strictly because he had information that we were too afraid to look at, or our ancestors were too afraid to look at. So he was, it's easy to wield power over someone when they're ignorant, when they don't know what's happening. And, and don't I, know the right questions to ask. Right. That's that mind, because I think a lot of what mind control is, Catherine, is basically black magic. It's using repetitive repetitions of words, repetitions of 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 uh, images like the news, repetition of information to get you to start to believe it, which can be a form of of spell casting, spelling words, programming people to believe a certain way, and so. And if anyone wants more information on that, I cannot recommend enough reading Kathy or listening to, I listen to an audio, Kathy O'Brien's trance book. It goes into this in so much detail because, and when you listen to it, it sort of pulls a lot of the little hidden bits of the jigsaw puzzle together and really explains just how this is done and how so many areas of the military, the three letter agencies have been using this knowledge for years and years to various different effects. And we've seen a lot of that in the most recent last few years of the pandemic, these same tactics and um, tools being applied. And unfortunately, it's very difficult to see it whilst you're still under that spell. You've got mm -hmm. to have something that breaks you out of that spell to suddenly be able to just view life from a slightly different angle. Oh, and they play with, and it's playing with the human emotion as well. Like these people, you know, even thinking about the Federal Reserve, mm. they sold the Federal Reserve, mainly the way they were able to sell the Federal Reserve was that it was going to provide a public, in, in the United States, public means government. I know it's different, but for yeah. like a free education. So before the Federal Reserve, education, you know, we had kids in workhouses, like education was not... Which to me, life skills give you education too. So I, I hate to say like that. The only way to get an education, I'm sure those street kids hawking newspapers in the, er, in the early 1900s probably had more common sense than most humans do today, and they were not educated. So uh, well, they had to. It was survival of the fittest, wasn't it? Exactly. Like they, they're, they're, um, you know. So I, I use the, the term education loosely. Mm. Um, but before, when I first looked into Federal Reserve, before the Federal Reserve was created with our, our educational system in, in the United States. Kids at a very young age were learning to speak Greek, were learning to speak Coptic, Egypt, Egyptian, Latin. Mer American kids spoke multiple languages, mostly dead languages, so that they could read old, old transcripts. Mm. Now, over a hundred years later, most American kids can't even speak English. Yeah, but they sold it as this idea that all these kids were going to put in labor, child labor law. So now kids have to go to school. Well, that's interesting. So they're not free range anymore. They're not feral anymore. They have to go to school. They have to go to school. And I think at first Therefore, was, you can completely control what they've got access to. They can't learn from mom and dad anymore. They can't go to the one room schoolhouse where they have a private tutor. The school now, the government now is taking over. And since most people can't afford private education, they're going to send their kids to public, still to this day, to a yeah. public school where the government has them. And I think it was like, at one point, it was like up to the sixth grade was legal. Then um, when I was a kid, you had to go in the United States up to your 15. If you wanted to drop out of school at 15, you could. But then they make it so you can't really get a job unless you have a high school degree or more importantly, have a, a bachelor's degree, a, a university, four-year university degree. And then about 10 years after I was out of university, it became mandatory for people to have their master's. So mm -hmm. they kept, they keep upping the ante and it's all mind control. And we've seen this with, you know, I, sometimes I think there's two 
trains of thought I have with archaeologists. Some of archaeologists are badasses because if you want to learn the truth about what's going on, look at some lawsuits like, with archaeologists with like the Smithsonian and stuff. You'll see archaeologists getting pissed that their work is being changed. Yeah. And there's some that are so, because then you have the funding, right? Same thing with uh, President Wilson and Untermeyer with the, with the honeycombing, but then you've also got funding. If, if, What's that joke like doctors are going to believe are going to are going to um, agree with 100 percent of the scientists are the, the people who are funding them? Absolutely. And that again, we've seen that 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 isn't conspiracy at all. I mean, you have just got to follow the money trail back. And, you know, at the end of the day, these people, uh, they're backed into a corner. And, you know, if you're in the system where you're mortgaged up to the hilt you want to pay for your kids education things and you're in that trap then you're very easily controllable like that i saw the funniest meme it's been on going around scrolling around on youtube or uh, instagram and it's this guy saying my cheat my and when i was in school my teacher used to fuss at us and say if we didn't pay attention we were going to end up like the garbage man but what my teacher felt failed to tell us is that the garbage man actually made more money than she does yes so we I, I mean the thing is the beauty is is sometimes in life you have to really let things go really really badly wrong before you're forced into making a change but getting back to Atomai, i can never pronounce it properly park i think the reason why i was speaking to someone else they said why is this so important i said it's why these things are so important because they hold the keys to the control mechanisms of how the other side, I'm just going to call it, have managed how so few people connected across the whole globe can use that knowledge transfer. Just like in ancient tribes, whatever we used to want to believe, we used to have far time storytelling that yep. taught people where the water holes were, how to survive, what plants you could raise, what medicines to use. They've used those ancient traditions to pass them down in a very narrow group to harness certain energies to control the masses. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And this is um, and this is it's so important, too, because, Catherine, we're going to do a part two. We're going to film it next week over the Son of Sam murders. And for people to truly understand the Son of Sam murders and then look at other cases, other serial killers, even in your own country, if you just start pulling back the layers, because it's going to Untermeyer Park is where all this kicked off. Mm. And it's going to open up this whole like Pandora's box of, of just how much stuff is going on around us at all times that we don't know. And it's interesting. You said this, Catherine, I was, when you say people just sit around campfires and tell these stories in tribal times. And I always say, I think I'm, I'm the last great generation. If you were born between 1980 and 1984, you're in a sub generation called the Zennials. Cause we're kind of a mixture of generation X and the millennial. We're too feral to be millennials. We're, we're, but you know, we're kind of the last, those four years were kind of, in my opinion, the last great generation because we still, we didn't have internet. We played outside. There was a commercial at night where they would go at 10 o'clock. You know where your kids are. They'd remind people they actually had children, you know? Um, and I remember growing up and, and growing up at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountain, we learned a lot about Native American culture. And I remember learning about pointing trees. And we see them, as, as you were saying this, Catherine, I, it just came into about the, the, the stories around the, the bonfires and stuff. If I were to be in the, up in the Appalachian Mountains and I needed water, I would know how to find water because of pointing trees. Because we were taught about that. The Native Americans were able to create these trees that literally jutted out and pointed towards water. Wow, and I didn't, we have, I've never heard of that. We wow. have them all over my backyard. Like, they're everywhere in Georgia. You see this. If you're ever in Georgia and you see a weird pointed tree, when we do our wellness retreat, I'm sure you'll see a ton of them. And it's how, because it's so thick and woody here, the Native Americans would, would create, I don't, still know, don't know how they did it. They made these trees grow in a certain way that they literally pointed like an arrow towards water. Wow. And so if you're stuck and you're thirsty, and you need to find the Chattahoochee River or the Ustanala or a lake, you just look for a pointing tree. You'll find one. They're going to be there. And then you just follow it. You go down and you'll find another one pointing. Like it's like it was like a road map before there were road maps. And just knowing that, especially in the times that we're living in now, I'm like, that's important information to have if you yeah. live in Appalachia, because that's how you're going to find water is from those old. We know those trees have been around for hundreds of years. Those, if those trees could talk, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's how you find water is through the pointing trees. And 
I'm sure kids today don't even know that. They don't even know that that's what that is, mm. you know, because I'm sure that they've stopped teaching that kind of stuff for survival Absolutely. purposes. And I think, you know, the survival skills, it's like when you stop teaching people's survival skills or passing that knowledge down, you want to hide into nothing as a species because no other species in the wild survives without handing down that knowledge from generation to generation. Absolutely. It's like even like when I was a kid, boys especially had to learn how to create fire by rubbing yeah, sticks together. Same here. Yeah. I don't know if they do that anymore, but it was required, especially for the boys in my class, to learn how to create fire in, in elementary school and how, how valuable is that. It's you know, I mean, even just being able to read cursive nowadays, kids yeah. aren't even learned cur they don't even know cursive. They can't even read cursive. And and that's super important. And you know, the thing is too, like taking it back to Sam Untermeyer. I'm pretty sure Sam Untermeyer was taught these practices from his parents who mm. learned it from their parents. That's why he was able to harness it. And so I think that moving forward, in my opinion, Catherine, I know we've talked about this, like you're, you let your kids kind of free reign with food in the wild sometimes, like allowing our children, and I'm not a parent, but allowing those opportunities of exploration and teaching kids things like spirituality and so that they understand these things so that they're not fooled by a Sam Untermeyer, right? Or you know, a Jeffrey Epstein. So important. And I, I just, I, I've really loved over the last month, I've connected in with a lot more homesteading people. And it's just beautiful to see what the last three years in particular, obviously longer, but a huge, huge influx of the amount of people that are now getting back to learning how to garden, getting back to learn how to preserve their own foods without electricity, um, and, and really taking back the power and home educating their children in, in actual practical life skills that they can use for survival. Because the thing is, we never stop learning throughout our lives. You know, we're constantly learning. So there's plenty of time to learn the non-survival skills later in life, but there's not plenty of time to... You know, if you haven't learned those when the need comes, you're not going to survive to actually learn the other niceties that you might want to look into. No, it's so important. I just um, actually I'm going to ask that kind of for for our, our friends watching right now. What's an important life skill that you feel like you were taught as a child that they don't teach kids anymore? I, I'm curious to see wherever you are in the world. So like if you're from the southeast, you might know about pointing trees, but someone in England wouldn't know about that because they didn't have any. Yeah. Americans. So wherever you are in the world, if there is something, you know, here in the southeast, we had to learn the rhymes with snakes because there's so many poisonous snakes like red on black. You better step back. Red on yellow could kill a fella so that we could see they didn't stop us from going outside as kids. They didn't hover and put. Yeah, you know, put us in styrofoam and cellophane and send us out. No, they just taught us these these rhymes so that we could learn ourselves and be on the lookout for poisonous snakes. Because we needed to learn that, right? It, we, we didn't need to be protected. Okay. We needed to learn that as kids, that red on black, you better step back. Red on yellow can kill a fellow. So and do you get how I just wanted to ping up that that's such an important point you said. You all taught that, and it wasn't called fear-mongering then. Mm -mm. It was just general good parenting yeah. and the children weren't traumatized by being told that language. And I think we could learn so much here because we've reached a stage of, of society where so many people, any time you try and tell something that could be useful information that could save someone's life, whether it's what's in your water, what's in the air, what's in your food, people accuse you of fear mongering and there is a lot of fear mongering but just like conspiracy theorists these terms are that are deliberately thrown around to too much to put people off the course and you can most children can cope with a lot of knowledge if delivered in a practical way and it's not going to terrorize them it's not going to scare them but it could save their life oh absolutely and i think you know i think about my parents like when we would play out in the woods because we're at the base of appalachia yeah. so you're in the woods they they were expected us to get hurt. They expected Absolutely. us to get bitten by. I mean, we have like bees that will nest in the ground, and if you step on the nest, you'll get stung. That happened to me lots of times with with friends, where we would step and then we get stung yeah. by bees. And it's a lesson learned, and that's that's how you learn it. So now, as at forty, when I'm up in the woods, even at forty, I'm I know what to look for. Yeah. I have a better understanding of the mountain and a better understanding of nature and what's concerning and what isn't concerning. And, and that's, and that, and, and you're right, Catherine, so many people try to like protect people now and wrap them up in cellophane and, and it, Oh, don't talk about anything bad when it's not bad. It's, it's education. 
and yeah, it's, 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 it's hard it's a fine line to sort of balance it but actually if we made these conversations commonplace we wouldn't all be so brainwashed we would spot the signs we would we wouldn't be so afraid to ask questions i think this is the beauty of what you're uncovering here and what doug did so well is like answering these questions with an open mind and then letting that information flow is so so important and i think that's something that i think all our listeners you know luckily we're, to, we're as we say before we're preaching to the converted but never stop asking those questions and never forget and never be afraid to tell someone something really important that could save their life we can't be responsible for what people listen to and particularly as adults most people are so set in their belief systems it's quite hard to change but children aren't and children can have an influence on their parents very effectively and we should not be afraid to pass on this information it's so so important so important so yeah guys let us know in the comment section some some vital piece of information you got as a child something simple like i just talked about from your country or your area of the world that you feel like children should still know today learn today and let me know your opinion on sam untemeyer and and um again i'm going to put that part the deep dive um part one into uh, the description box we're doing, I'm doing the satanic cult, many different parts going through Doug's work as well. And so Catherine and I will be um, separate from our coffee chats. We'll be doing a whole, um, um, I keep wanting to say summer of Sam, son of Sam, which Untermeyer Park is a huge part of that. So that's why I started with Untermeyer Park. We'll be releasing that next week, you guys, part two. So how do you want to end this, Catherine? Anything you want to tell our friends? I love it what you said. Uh, the beauty of this is your, what you find is one little bit of information leads on to another little bit of information leads to another. So I would just like to um, implore anyone, if there's anything that you're you're drawn to share, share it. We, we're not worried about right or wrong here. It doesn't exist. We're saying, look, let's put these bits of the digital puzzle together to because we'll all have a different you know something will have triggered in you when you're listening to this that you might go away and have a look at um so please please do share any thoughts and and you know anyone in the comments be encouraging to anyone that shares because this is what we've got to do is open up questions not shut them down we and not shame that. people for for saying what if we don't don't wait until we've got all the answers to share because we'll never get the answers if we oh. wait to that stage no and and i think we've said this catherine the more the more we learn the less we know absolutely it's so true and but it's equally so exciting because how boring would it be and also i don't want the knowledge i've been taught to be right <laughs> no then what i'm realizing now is is the truth is so much more exciting so much more exciting yeah um, and we're just starting to put some of these important bits of the jigsaw puzzle and so many other people across the globe as well and just one little thing can trigger something that pulls a whole new range of information in so go for it oh yeah for sure for sure you guys okay so next week part two summer son son of sam will be part two guys so if you have not seen part one watch it so you are research onto my part for yourself just so you have a base information of where we're starting and this is gonna there's gonna be multi parts we're gonna go through the process church of the final judgment we're gonna go into Charles Manson and the family and um, the uh, Sharon Tate murder we're gonna go into um, oh my mind's gone blank now there's so much uh, Scientology L Ron Hubbard Jack uh, Parsons Alistair Crowley, all that kind of stuff, you guys. And we're going to be basing it off of Doug's research because he was going to be doing this too. And then we're going to expand upon that to keep and make sure, guys, I'm going to put Doug's channel down in the description box too. I know he's passed away, but go, go, go subscribe to his channel. He still has a, the whole library of all his work is up there. So go watch his channel. I know his moderator had commented and said that they've got everything saved. So even if his channel does go down, everything's been backed up and saved. I've pulled a lot of his stuff too, but we are not going to let his work die, die because I think he lived one of the most powerful lives of any person I know. And just to be able to put himself out there and in a very loving way, share what he had found and so um and doug if you're listening protect these videos for us buddy on the other side because <laughs> you know we're just, we're still here dealing with shadow banning so so um, so anyway well thank you for this Catherine. i know it's oh, i've loved it i mean you've opened up a whole new world to me of something that i knew nothing about but there's all these little bits of my brain now that are pulling in different connections that were 
probably take me a little bit of while to pull together but thank you so much for your research Bryce because oh, Doug, it's, this, all Doug. it's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant and thank you so much for anyone that watches this and can pull out some other bits of the jigsaw puzzle for us yeah I can't wait I'm sorry as you're saying this Catherine I'm like I can't wait to see other people from other countries that know of a serial killer and they start looking into it and they're like Exactly. Holy shit. They use the same formula over in Romania. They use the same formula yeah. over in Bosnia. Like, you know, because they can't create guys. So they just do the same thing. It's the same playbook. Completely. So, completely. So, all right, guys. Well, Thank next you. Week, we'll be back next week. We'll be on Catherine's channel for Coffee Chat next week. And you'll, you'll get a double dose of us together. We'll, we'll also be releasing on both of our channels part two of um, the, the Satanic Cult, some, uh, Son of Sam. So, all right, you guys. Have a wonderful That's week. Bye, guys. Bye.